Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, beginning with, uh, I, I know, uh, General Dunford, you're a, you're a reader, and uh, going back to the, to the chairman's statements at the beginning of this hearing about the relationship between the military and civilian officials, I commend to you, although I suspect you have already read a dereliction of duty by your colleague, uh, General McMaster, a stunning analysis of what not to do in terms of the relationship between civilian and military officials. You nodded. I uh, assume that means you, you, know, the, you know the book. Uh, Senator, I have read it. And I think uh, an additional one I would add to your list, it's a little bit longer, uh, Barbara Tuchman's March of Folly, which takes us from Troy to Vietnam, again, talking about relationships and how these mistakes are, are made. Which brings me to Korea. I have a queasy feeling that we're in 1914 stumbling towards Sarajevo. And what worries me is not an instantaneous nuclear confrontation, but an accidental escalation. Uh, based upon the rhetoric uh, that's going back and forth. The foreign minister of North Korea yesterday characterized our president's comments as a declaration of war. And he said, therefore, as a, since the United States has declared war in our country, we will have every right to make countermeasures, including the right to shoot down United States strategic bombers, even when they are not in the airspace border of our country. That's what worries me, is a misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and an event, a shooting down of a bomber, a, a strike on a, on a ship that leads to a countermeasure, that leads to a countermeasure, and the end result is if King, Kim Jong-un feels his regime is under attack, then the unthinkable happens. Make me even, either feel better or worse about where we are. Uh, Senator, I, I will make you feel better. I, I can tell you that I personally, uh, the Secretary of Defense and Admiral Harris, uh, are looking at all of our posture in, uh, in managing risk on a day-to-day -day basis informed by the need to avoid the risk of miscalculation. Uh, the recent uh, operations that we conducted, I can assure you that uh, even I was on the road, we probably, uh, Secretary Mass and I probably uh, personally invested several hours each in, uh, in reviewing those uh, to manage those and without going into classified information here to look at all of our capabilities, look at all their capabilities, look at timing, look at the probabilities. What worries me about is misunderstanding and misinterpretation. What we view as an exercise, they may view as an imminent threat. Senator, what I, I guess what I'm suggesting to you is that where we conduct these exercises, we're informed by uh, the North Korean posture at a given point in time. We're informed by the need to avoid miscalculation in an inadvertent uh, engagement. Do we have communication with North Korea uh, with regard to these kinds of, of, of situations? We, we, this, this is yeah. just an exercise, for right. example. Uh, we do not have military-to-military -military communications with uh, North Korea right now. Turning the North Korea question slightly, you testified earlier, and all the intelligence community agrees, that Kim Jong-un's primary motivation is regime survival. Therefore, it seems to me that statements that suggest regime change or regime destruction only solidify his uh, determination to develop and maintain nuclear weapons. Would you agree? Senator, I, I have been very careful at the, at the military level to make uh, no statements that would exacerbate the current crisis, and, and I, I certainly won't comment on, on things that our senior political leadership have said, but I certainly can tell you inside the military uh, we've made no statements and we've had a conscious uh, decision not to make any such statements to ensure that the lead right now is Secretary Tillerson and the message that being delivered is primarily being delivered by the State Department. But you do agree that the primary motivation for the development of the nuclear weapons is a kind of insurance policy for regime survival. Is that not the case? That would be my assessment, Senator. Fine. Thank you. Um, what would be the practicality of a preemptive nuclear strike or a preemptive military strike on North Korea in terms of the, the military effect? Would it, uh, there's some feeling, I hear somebody talked about a preemptive strike the other day, not in, not in the administration, but, uh, but on this, in this body. Uh, that would not be a short, easy action, would it not? Senator, you bring up a, a, a good point, and, and, and part of the advice that I've provided the data is when we do something, we shouldn't assume at that point that we can control escalation. So we need to, we need to think about this uh, in terms of what might happen as well as what we would want to happen. And part of the problem is those 
artillery uh, uh, that are ranged across the North Korean border within Seoul, which is about as far as from here to Fairfax County. That's right. The, the greater Seoul area, which has 25 million people, uh, 250,000 Americans on any given day, it would be in Seoul, would certainly be threatened by the rockets and the missiles uh, along the border. So a military, the, the idea of a so-called surgical strike, to bring back a term from 40 years ago, is really not valid in this situation. It would, it would not be, uh, this is not something that would be easy to take out, for example, the nuclear capability of the North Koreans. No, that's right, Senator. I mean, well, we could do things that, uh, from our perspective, uh, it could be less than uh, a full execution of an operations plan. Uh, we need to be informed by the potential risk to the greater Seoul area, no matter what we do on the peninsula. I think that's fair. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.